All right, thank you. So at least we've seen many, many people are back. Um, so without wasting much time, so we're just going to go ahead and uh, uh, listen to the, the next key speaker that we have. So this is none other than Dr. Uh, Lighton Piri. So we have actually an interesting, uh, a very interesting background about uh, Dr. Piri. So he's a lecturer and researcher at the University of Zambia. He has uh, a, a, a PhD in computer science and a master's of science in uh, computer science, both from University of Cape Town. And he also holds a bachelor of science degree in computer science from the University of Zambia. So you can actually find out more about uh, him um, uh, online through our page. So we actually shared a profile of uh, most of the works that he's done, but I'll, I'll hand over the floor to him. Then he can uh, give us uh, more insight on his background and then move on to uh, actually delivering the talk for the day. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Piri, over to you. All right, uh, so just checking if uh, if you can hear me. Uh, I'm experimenting with a new setup, so I'm not sure if my, my current microphone uh, is fine. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, Doc. Yes, we can hear you. And then also just confirming if you can see uh, the slide deck. So I've just been there. Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Now, so uh, thank you again for extending this invitation. I think this is an amazing, uh, uh, an amazing initiative. Um, and I hope we can, we can carry this forward and make sure that we do this uh, every year. Uh, and in fact, if possible, maybe we can do it twice a year or something. Right? Now, um, I was told that I have uh, two hours to give my talk, but what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to see if I can just uh, scale it down to maybe an hour or an hour and a half because I would much rather we have a conversation uh, centered around some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. Um, right, so the title of my talk is uh, Using Machine Learning Techniques for Solving Locally Relevant Problems. Uh, and this in part borders on uh, the definition of machine learning that was highlighted by, by the panel discussion speakers. I don't know if people remember this. Um, I just want to mention upfront that uh, what I do and what we do together with the students that I, I work with is we, we work a lot with data, um, but we work with data in such a way that um, our activities um, transcend beyond uh, uh, so it's statistical uh, techniques that were highlighted, right? So we, we take advantage of both supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. Um, something else I want to mention up front here is that most of the activities that we've been doing for the last three years, at least uh, a situation I've been at Monza, um, mostly involve working with text. So I do apologize if I'm going to bore you with uh, examples that are linked to uh, document classification and text mining, right? All right. Um, now, I'll do a bit of advertising here. Um, uh, so uh, I happen to be a founding member of what we are calling the Data Lab Research Group at the University of Zambia. Um, one, one of the cool things about working in academia is you get to work with very motivated and highly intelligent students. I mean, I do this every year. So any given year, I supervise both uh, masters and uh, finally undergraduate students. And it's, it's amazing just what students are capable of doing. Um, and on that one, I should mention that uh, most of the things that we'll be talking about in here have been done mostly in conjunction with uh, students, right? So our, our research group uh, conducts research in three main areas, uh, data mining, digital libraries, and technology-enhanced learning. But most of the examples I'm going to talk about are centered around data mining, right? Uh, please find time and uh, visit our site. Uh, if you come across some interesting projects that we're working towards and you'd want to collaborate with us, please do reach out to me. We'd be very happy to work with you. Uh, every year we have uh, uh, an army of students um, that are keen to work or to collaborate uh, on projects that are centered towards industry. All right, so, so I, I decided to split my talk into three parts. Uh, um, and I guess part one has mostly been covered already. I wanted to just give a brief introduction to what I 
I'm calling uh, data-driven problem solving, essentially just a gentle introduction to uh, so-called machine learning. So I'll close through this and then I'll get to part two where I will get to talk about some of the projects that I am cu currently involved with. Um, <clears throat> these are both uh, toy projects that are conducted by, by undergraduate students, uh, but also industry-centric projects that I'm working with together with uh, other colleagues at UNSA. So these are colleagues uh, from School of Engineering and uh, School of Natural Sciences as well. Um, and then in part three, I thought it would be important to, to touch on what I see as some of the potential problems that we could be working, working on, right? Um, as part of this group, right? All right. Um, so, I mean, the broad definition of, of artificial intelligence has, has already been, been highlighted here. Um, I just wanted to, again, highlight the fact that uh, our focus in terms of what I've been, what I'm interested in and what we do in our research group is centered around machine learning, right? So we take advantage of both uh, traditional machine learning techniques, um, but also uh, the more recent hype that's uh, tied to so-called deep learning, right? Um, obviously they all fall under the broad um umbrella of machine learning. So like I earlier said, it's, it's both supervised and unsupervised machine learning. It turns out that certain instances where um, we tend to work on problems where we, we don't have um, a clear goal or objective. So what we'd be interested in doing is uncovering patterns, right? So that's your classic um, unsupervised machine learning. Now, the key, right? The key to everything that is to do with machine learning is obviously data. If you do not have data, um, you can't take advantage of these machine learning techniques, right? Uh, now, when we talk about data here, um, I mean, it's everything ranging from the things that we see when we log on to Facebook, for instance, I saw a post on, on, um, on the, the, the organization's Facebook page there, right? Um, but also uh, weird things like uh, uh, these um, videos that we access on platforms such as TikTok, you know, Instagram and YouTube, right? It turns out that people are doing a lot of interesting things uh, with all these uh, types of data, but also um, sound as well, right? Um, now I know uh, whenever people are discussing, you know, machine learning, the obsession is always about uh, images, right? I just wanted to hint that uh, there's, there's these other types of data that we should, we should take into account. I mean, if you look at uh, sound, for instance, there's, there's rich data sets that, uh, there are rich data sets that are generated by entities such as telecommunications organizations, right, or banks, when they're interacting with their customers, for instance. I would like to think that uh, industry would be interested in people that are willing to provide solutions, right? Um, if you look at video data, I mean, there are entities such as movie TV and parliament TV, which are generating video footage almost on a daily basis, right? If you move around town these days, in the, on the streets of Osaka here, you'll find that we have uh, cameras all over, right? The questions we should be asking ourselves is, I mean, what, what interesting things can we do, right? With, with, with this video footage that we're generating, right? Um, just wanted to put it out there here. Um, and again, this is still, I, I suppose, machine learning 101. It's, it's worth appreciating the typical data mining pipeline that you tend to go through when you're solving such problems, right? In essence, irrespective of whether you are trying to leverage supervised machine learning or unsupervised machine learning, um, essentially what you're interested in doing is trying to uncover patterns and knowledge from existing data, right? So what you're doing is you're extracting information, right? Uncover patterns, essentially. Um, and in the case of uh, supervised machine learning, for instance, this would be um, historical data, right? Or existing data that has been properly labeled, right? So it's properly cleaned and labeled. Um, but it turns out before you can proceed further, you need to make sure that uh, the data that you're working with obviously is, uh, is sufficient and um, it's a, it, it, has pre -pre it has been pre-processed um, in such a way that it can later on be trans transform and then uh, fade into whatever model that you're implementing, right? Um, 
And this in part, I suppose, is, it's, it's an important point to note because I think it was highlighted by Amelia, right, Dr. Taylor, when she, she made mention of the fact that sometimes, or most of the times, um, youngsters will tend to get excited about the cool stuff, the cool factor, right? Uh, so if you look at your typical machine learning uh, pipeline, a lot of hype is usually uh, centered around the modeling part. It turns out that that's probably one of the simplest things you can do, right? Um, there are studies that have been conducted that point to the fact that uh, uh, the things that are time consuming involve data preparation, for instance. So the process of cleaning up and uh, formatting your data, scaling it, then later on transforming it, that's, that's the part that uh, uh, tends to consume uh, quite a bit of time. Um, and this explains why I guess most people normally run away from that by just going to places like Kirko, as Yelia mentioned, and then you download data that has already been prepared for you. But you must remember that um, if you find yourself working on a real life project, you're going to have to execute all uh, the data mining uh, phases, right? Depending on the type of uh, approach you're following. You know. So the next step obviously is uh, once you clean up your data, what you do is uh, you need to make sure that it's properly labeled, and then, then you can uh, implement your machine learning model, right? And then ultimately, depending on whether this uh, machine learning model or inference model is uh, online or offline, you can then um, deploy it, right? Uh, so usually these, these models are deployed as web services, right? So you create some sort of API that can later on be interfaced uh, with some third party application tool. Uh, the simplest, I guess the simplest approach, right? Uh, takes the form of, um, you know, you ex ex exporting or pickling your model, and then um, you use that as a basis to implement the, the API itself. And so a very simple process, essentially, the things that I'm going to talk about in part two and part three, are going to assume that uh, you understand this pipeline. Right? Um, but it turns out that there's a systematic way that needs to be followed for you to execute problems that are machine learning in nature, right? Um, the good news is that there are predefined uh, methodologies or approaches, right? That have been tried and tested. Uh, so if you go to this, um, to this uh, resource here, you will gain access, you can read up more on all these different types of uh, data mining models that exist. Uh, I should mention upfront here is that uh, we mostly lean towards the so-called CRISP-EM model, uh, and more recently, uh, the CRISP-ML model, they call it. Uh, this proposed in 2019 here. But um, it turns out that irrespective of the type of, um, of model that you would want to take advantage of to execute a data mining project, um, if you look at the different phases, right, you will gain an appreciation of the fact that uh, there are certain phases, as I mentioned, that will take up uh, quite a bit of your time. I always uh, remind students that I work with that um, Sometimes if you find yourself working in a domain, right, that you don't understand, um, the domain understanding itself might uh, eat up a bit of your time. There's a master's student I've been working with for almost two years now, um, and he's doing a lot of document classification, but he doesn't, he did not initially understand the domain and it took him quite a bit of time to understand the area before he could actually uh, start executing or coming up with the implementation of the models um, he proposed to, to design and implement, right? All right, uh, if you need, uh, uh, I suppose if you need uh, uh, justification for why we lean more towards the crisp gear model, I mean, if you go to uh, uh, websites like uh, KD Nuggets, for instance, you notice that there are interesting polls that will highlight, right? Popularity of the different types of um, models that are available out there, right? Data mining models. Uh, so as I mentioned, we lean more towards the crisp gear model. Obvious reasons, you notice here that, uh, um, it, it almost always comes out top on the list. And this is it's somewhat old, so it's done in 2014, but if you go to the site and try and access uh, the most recent poll, you notice that very little has changed actually. That's not to say that you can't come up with your own model. You notice that uh, quite a number of people just come up with uh, their own methodology right, of executing this data mining project. Um, if you need details about the other uh, methodologies that I just highlighted, the crisp ML model, uh, I do encourage you to go to that resource, right? It's a, it's a very easy read. It's not uh, in any way technical, uh, quite lengthy, but uh, well worth the read. So I do encourage you to go there. So I'm going to pause here and just uh, ask if uh, 
you can still hear me. I don't know if you can still hear me here. Hi, Doctor. Yes, we can still hear you. Okay, thanks. All right. So um, I, th I thought I would uh, talk a bit more about uh, some, some of the things that I have been involved with, right? These are serious projects, not toy projects. Um, and I'll, I'll, start, I'll start by just uh, telling you uh, a story about uh, what we are doing to try and uh, ensure that we increase the online visibility of research output that's generated in Zambia, right? Um, so it turns out, right, that if you look at the research landscape, um, when you look at the things that researchers produce, the tangible output, so publications, for instance, technical reports, journal articles, conference proceedings, uh, including dissertations, by the way, that are produced by uh, postgraduate students, what you notice that uh, uh, overall, if you look at Africa as a whole, right, relative to the contribution of research output, you realize that uh, there's very little that is apparent or reported becoming from, from Africa, right? Despite the fact that, uh, I mean, if you look at Zambia as a case example, for instance, there's mention of the fact that we have a total of, what is it, 67 universities, so higher education institutions. Um, the question is, uh, where is that research, right? It's not like people are not doing research, right? Uh, there are studies that have been conducted, by the way. But it turns out that part of the reason why the visibility is low is because there aren't deliberate measures put in place to make sure that uh, this research is visible, right? Now you can sit here and make an argument for why it's not visible, but if you look at uh, specific uh, academic databases available out there, in this case, this is uh, OATD. Um, so what this portal does is it makes available dissertations and theses produced by postgraduate students from around the world. Um, the block size uh, tells you the relative importance of the relative quantity produced by that region or that particular country, right? So left is good, right is bad, right? Uh, top is good, bottom is bad here. Now, I just want to draw attention to Africa here, right? Uh, if you look at Africa, actually within Africa, notice that uh, South Africa is good, the rest quite bad here. Um, if we are graduating masters and PhD students, where are the dissertations, right? They're not online. Um, now you might sit there and you're asking, well, why do you waste time? We've been doing this, I've been doing this for quite some time, uh, trying to understand this problem for the last three years, actually. Um, well, the other reason why you want this sort of research to be available online is that there are interested parties, such as policymakers, right? That ultimately benefit from this research output. Uh, people have a misconception about what an entity like the UNSA does, right? They think that uh, the only thing that academic members of staff do there is just teach. That's not the case. I'm a person like Lighton specifically employed to conduct research, to teach, and to perform community engagement. So what I'm doing right now is community engagement, by the way. Um, so the interested stakeholders, like policymakers, non-governmental organizations that depend on the uh, high quality research that is produced at these, uh, at these uh, higher education institutions, right? I'll give you an example of uh, recent uh, things that have happened in relation to uh, things like uh, the introduction of um, regional languages to be used as a mode of instruction from grades one to five. That is informed by research, right? Um, so it's in everybody's best interest to make sure that this stuff is available online. Well, so um, the question is, what are we doing, right? Uh, by the way, there's, there's other reasons why you want this research to be visible, right? It directly feeds into the ranking of institutions. One of the reasons why these institutions in Zambia rank in the thousands here on the world stage is in part because the research that we produce is not visible, right? Um, anyway, I, I don't know if you find this problem as interesting as I do, but I will get to the stage that perhaps we excite uh, people. Uh, so the type of machine learning stuff we've been doing. I just thought I would uh, motivate for why uh, I spend time doing this. And I spend a lot of time doing this, right? Myself and my students. Um, so we've, we've conducted studies that have been specific to the University of Zambia to try and understand this phenomenon, right? And what we've discovered for the case of the University of Zambia is that uh, there are a number of reasons as to why um, you know, uh, the online visibility of uh, research output is quite low at UNSA, right? Uh, I won't uh, waste a lot of your time by looking at uh, uh, 
the research findings from this research, what I'll do is I'll just point you to this resource, right? It's freely available, it's not paywall. Uh, again, I think it's an easy read. All you have to do is probably just read the abstract and the introduction if you don't have time. Uh, I think it's interesting, not because I authored it, but because I think we talk about important problem here. Um, but they're interesting findings, uh, right? Things like, uh, you notice that there's a huge delay, there are huge delays between when research is published and when it finds itself on certain platforms that are used to showcase research, right, online. So entities like the University of Zambia have uh, platform software tools called institutional repositories that are used to, uh, to make available research output, right? So for instance, this research or this publication here is archived on the UNSA, on the UNSA's uh, institutional repository, but also on our departmental document archive, right? So this is an example of uh, an institutional repository. In this case, it's a subject repository. So there are a number of factors that we identified really, right? Um, ranging from the fact that there are some institutions that don't have uh, software platforms for, for archiving research at all, right? In some instances, um, uh, these platforms have been neglected as is the case for CBU, for instance. Now, uh, what we've done, what we've been doing is we decided to take a multifaceted approach or multi-pronged approach where we are, we are really uh, experimenting with different approaches to try and provide solutions to this problem, right? So this ranges from very trivial things, things that could be considered trivial by someone who has an IT background, like teaching people how to take advantage of open source uh, tools, right? To, um, to publish research online, right? Um, so over the last year or two, I've been heavily involved at the UNSA and elsewhere in helping people set up platforms such as uh, open journal systems, um, helping them set up institutional repositories. Uh, more recently, we were interacting with colleagues from Zika's University. So Zika's University is finally online. They're able to publish uh, research output on their institutional repository, right? We're doing something similar with, uh, with Nkrumah University as well, right? Um, in effect, we're trying to, to see if we can build a network where we can, uh, we can help our colleagues do this, right? Um, we've also reached out to um, high authorities. So uh, some two years ago, we initiated conversations with the uh, education uh, authority to try and see if they could uh, partner with us so that we could, we could work towards ensuring that uh, most of these institutions actually make available their research output online. This is in their best interest, by the way. Um, and then, of course, I mean, we are also experimenting with uh, tech-centric, uh, more hardcore, I suppose, tech-centric uh, solutions. Like for instance, we, we do a lot of uh, machine learning-centric research, right? Um, where we try to explore possibilities of trying to automate certain manual processes. And it turns out that uh, some workflows that are associated with uh, making this information available online are manual, right? They're manual-like processes. They, they require human intervention at various levels. And so we've been trying to see if we could figure out, we can figure out exactly how we can automate some of those uh, workflows. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, the UNSA Institutional Repository only has two people that are employed to deposit content into the repository. Now, these people are employed to do other things. Um, but for you to appreciate the, the problem with that setup is that the UNSA currently has almost 900 faculty staff, right? Each of which, or most of who generate uh, quite a bit of research, right? So they're dependent on the two members of staff to deposit content once they publish. Uh, you also have students that graduate every year, postgraduate students. Their research output has to be deposited onto these platforms. Um, and you have these two, two individuals that are tasked to, to, to do this, right? The result, there's a huge backlog. So if you go to the institutional, the UNSA institutional repository, you'll notice that there's research that was done maybe some two years ago that has not yet been uploaded. Right? Also, because uh, the process is manual in nature, what you have is a situation where uh, there are a lot of errors associated with uh, metadata, right? That is associated with these documents. Um, all of these problems I'm highlighting uh, could potentially be addressed by taking advantage of uh, machine-centric solutions, right? Um, so, and this is what we've, we've been doing, right? Um, so one of the things we've, we've, we've done in the recent past is we've uh, implemented um, uh, classification models, right? Classification models that are aimed at automatically classifying 
certain aspects associated to this document. So for instance, um, we have models that are able to classify the type of document that is meant to be ingested. So rather than have a human being uh, specify the type of a document that process is automated, freeing up the amount of time they'll dedicate to doing that. Um, right? So uh, details of uh, the classification models that we've implemented are available uh, in this publication here. Um, uh, in essence, um, for us to get to a stage where we, we've implemented these classification models, um, we've had to, unfortunately, or for the most part, actually, unfortunately, build or construct our own data sets. Right? So there's nothing like going to Perigo here, uh, or I don't know which other platforms people use it to go and download already existing data. Right? We've had to do the data work ourselves. So we identify potential data sources, we extract the data, we you know, we, we properly format it and properly organize it. And then we've come up with data sets that we use as a basis for implementing these models. Now this, this borders on a number of things here. Um, number one, we are addressing um, problems that we consider to be locally relevant. More importantly though, we, we, we've sort of like come up with a formula that works for us, a formula we use to uh, create our own data sets. It's a lot of work. Um, but we managed to do this, right? And, and, and I want to challenge us to, uh, as deeply in our X here, to carefully start thinking about how we can uh, perhaps develop expertise or start working towards developing our own data sets rather than downloading already available data sets. So there are certain instances where you might be wanting to solve a particular problem and the data set doesn't exist. I always give an example of, um, and I think I have dedicated slides um, very, very soon, but I always give an example of machine translation, right? If you look at your typical comments on popular Facebook uh, pages, like uh, Zambian Watchdog or Mulan, for instance, what you notice is that the comments will typically be uh, posted in different languages other than English, right? There's some people that will have you know, a mix of English and uh, Bemba, uh, a bit of uh, Kichewa, maybe uh, Shitonga and Silos and whatnot. The, the thing there is if you download uh, data sets that already exist, they won't help you in any way because they won't understand what Bemba is all about, right? But, but if we can start thinking about how we can create those sort of data sets, um, then we'll be moving ahead here as a country, I suppose. But anyway, so, so as part of this particular project here, we, we've created a data set and by the way, whoever is interested in this data set, uh, reach out to us, we are more than happy to uh, make available this data set. If you're interested in uh, document classification or text mining, um, I think this is a great data set to work with, perhaps in part because uh, we created it ourselves. But in essence, uh, the, the features we are working with, uh, or we are working with this particular data set are just classic text features in essence, most of them at least. You know. uh, so things like uh, the title of the document, the abstract associated with the document, um, in certain instances, we have weird uh, markers or features, uh, such as uh, the number of pages associated with, with the document itself. Um, um, so just to showcase uh, uh, or to, to outline the process we had to go through for us to, to mine this data, um, we, 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 we had to, to do quite a, quite a number of things here. In essence, we were extracting this, the, the input features from two types of sources, right? So there's the descriptive information that is associated with the documents themselves, right? So uh, the publication like, like this thing here has certain markers, certain descriptive metadata like the title, the author, the abstract, right? The keywords, things of that nature, right? That describe the document, right? So we use that information as uh, to extract input features, but also we were extracting input features from the, the bitstream itself, right? So the PDF document itself. And I talked more about how we would just uh, do a simple text, uh, I mean, a PDF to text conversion, and then we extract the text features from the resulting text here, right? And, and we'll be mining this information from the cover pages, for instance, right? For now, it's just the cover pages, but subsequent problems that are being worked on by other students, we involve, um, you know, uh, uh, working with um, uh, techniques such as named entity recognition to try and extract certain information in the preamble of the document, right? So how do you figure out who the supervisor was, for instance, uh, which department this is coming from, right? Um, 
Right, so just to, again, to showcase the type of uh, text we're scraping off these PDF documents. Um, so it would be like the cover pages, right? Uh, cover page here, we extract this information, associating it to each individual observation, by the way. So the data set I'm talking about has details of uh, the text that you find on the cover page, the title of the document, the abstract, right? The author and all the nice stuff here. Um, and then in terms of the descriptive information, uh, we are fortunate in that the, this, uh, the platform where we're extracting this information, the institutional repository I was talking about, is implemented in such a way that it has, a, um, it has a, um, an API interface, it has API interfaces or endpoints, right, that you can use to extract information. And in our case, we're interested in extracting this information really using um, OAI, PMH, and OAI or uh, ORE protocols, right? Uh, interesting enough for us to, um, to, 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 to get certain information like the number of pages, what we were doing was, uh, again, getting metadata, but this is embedded metadata. So your typical uh, document, right? A PDF document. Uh, I don't know if people are aware that, uh, I'm just gonna do this here. I don't know if you can see. When you go to file properties, right? You have access to this descriptive information. This is a bad example because uh, this slide deck, uh, I didn't inject the metadata associated with this. Um, but, uh, but, but in essence, the, when, you, when you go to properties, you have access to embedded metadata, right? Within this embedded metadata, you have important information like number of pages for the document. So we're using, uh, uh, I don't know if people have used uh, tools, command line tools like PDF info, for instance, to extract that information, right? So information that is similar to uh, this image here. Uh, I don't mind being interrupted in case someone has a question. I don't know, or maybe the moderators will decide on whether to accept the questions here. Uh, so um, again, like, like mentioned, uh, extracting or getting a hold of the PDF documents. There's a lot of PDF documents, by the way. The data set uh, that we constructed has, uh, I think, close to about 5,000 or so uh, observations, right? Um, so the OAI, OAI protocols used to have this PDF documents, right? And then the uh, OAI PMH protocols used to harvest the descriptive information, the descriptive metadata, right? Um, this, it may be foreign to some people here, but uh, uh, the, the publications that I referenced on the previous slides here have more details on the actual procedure. In fact, um, my GitHub profile has that will give you access to some scripts that we are using to do this, uh, um, in, including, I think, uh, Jupyter notebook, uh, Jupyter notebooks that were used to implement the, the machine learning models. In, in um, but maybe I should also mention here that the process we were following through to, to mine the text from the PDF, right? Um, so this ranged from, uh, you know, splicing the PDF so that you remain with uh, portions of interest. So if in the case of the cover pages, for instance, we'll just uh, splice, uh, splice the first page um, using uh, utility tools such as PDFTK. I don't know if you've used that before. And then we'll do um, uh, a PDF to text conversion. There were some challenges with certain documents that are, uh, are not born digital. So if you go to the repository, some of the contents in that repository are scanned documents, right? And it turns out that uh, uh, OCI is not really that good, but what we, we found useful was to, to do uh, a conversion to PNG. So we'll do a PDF to PNG conversion, and then we'll use Tesseract to convert the PNG to text. That sort of like helped. Um, there's a, a huge proportion of documents that are actually scanned. And so um, excluding those scanned documents from our analysis wasn't really going to help us that much. Because I think uh, all documents before uh, 20, must have been 24 before, I believe most of them are actually scanned, right? And to give you a bit of context here, the University of Zambia, I think, uh, uh, had the first uh, postgraduate student graduate in, in the 60s or something, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, so uh, I don't know, I, I thought I, I decided deliberately to focus more on the process we followed to construct our own data set, um, in part to to underscore the importance of learning the art of doing this. Most people that are self-taught will just tend to focus on the modeling aspect, right? As Elia mentioned, the modeling part is only part of uh, the bigger picture here, right? 
there's a lot that needs to be done before you can get here. Right? Uh, most people tend to focus on the modeling and deployment, very little evaluation, actually. I thought I would mention that here. Um, all right, and then uh, we did the usual stuff that people do uh, in terms of implementing the so-called machine, machine learning models, right? Uh, the, the models that we implemented as part of this project, um, I mean, these are classic supervised machine learning type models, right? And, uh, uh, and in particular, um, all of these for this particular project, although there's uh, work that we've done since, but, but these are, these are uh, classification models, right? So we have uh, binary classifiers um, that help us classify whether uh, an ETD type is thesis or a dissertation, for instance, whether it's masters or PhD. We also have uh, a multi-class um, classification model, which helps us classify automatically um, the type of collection, right? or community that the document is supposed to be destined into. Uh, this helps us identify the structural metadata associated with the document. Um, but also we have uh, a multi-level classifier that helps us uh, automatically classify subjects that should be associated with the document. Right? Um, I thought I would showcase uh, the confusion mat mat matrix here. This is, this is tied to this ETD classification, right? You must use this for that. Uh, details uh, are available there if you are interested. I, I think this, this repository, I do believe, has uh, the scripts that were used to harvest data, um, but also these scripts that were used to pre-process the data to clean it up, I think, um, including the Jupyter notebooks that were used to come up with uh, all these fancy graphs you have. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the gory details of, of this uh, the GitHub repository has this, uh, this thing. For, for people that are developers, um, um, uh, I, I guess by profession, it may interest you to note that uh, the implementation of the API, uh, we use the uh, Flask, right? This is a Python library. Uh, we've found, personally, I, I find uh, Python to be, uh, I, Python is a preferred tool of choice when I'm working on machine-centric uh, machine problems. And so the end-to-end -end pipeline from scripting to uh, data preparation to modeling, evaluation and deployment heavily uses Flask, I mean, heavily uses Python. Uh, it makes our work a lot easier that way. The only part that might not use uh, Python is the part where you're implementing, let's say, you're deploying the application, uh, an application that involves uh, building some third-party tool. Uh, so currently I'm working with, uh, some undergraduate students that are building uh, a web application that is supposed to interact with this API. Um, and they're using um, um, a, JavaScript, a JavaScript, um, a JavaScript uh, technology stack, right? Uh, from React on the front end to Node.js on the back end, right? Um, and fancy things that people like talking about, like Express.js still on the back end here. But, but if you want details of implementation, you can go and download it there. Um, and then if you want to play around with the API itself, um, um, you can do that. So if you go to this, if you, on here, uh, the readme file has details of how you, you, you go about interacting with the API. So you can already play around with this, so download the source code and do whatever it is you want to do with it, right? Um, all right, so that, that was, uh, that was uh, the first part of the project, but it turns out that there's still stuff that we are doing. Um, um, so currently, uh, there's a master's student that is extending what we have worked at, what we've worked on previously, right? To to try and uh, and do much more than just automatically classify ATDs. Remember, I mentioned that uh, these software platforms will tend to have um, other documents, right? Besides ATDs, so you can have conference proceedings and journal articles and um, you know technical reports, right? Including student reports. Also, I don't know if that's a question. Sorry. Um, so, Doctor, just 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 to come in there and uh, just 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 to give you the assurance that people are still listening, we had some questions in the Q and A where people had already asked um, if uh, if there's a GitHub account where they can actually uh, if 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 our data is on GitHub. But thanks for answering that already. So people like are already interested to learn more, and we even had a question from. Uh, Jonathan will be one of our next speakers in the afternoon. Whether um, uh, he said, of course, he said like they should contact you 
uh, in uh, people like we should contact you in terms of uh, getting access to the data set. So Jonathan had asked whether why if, if the data is why the data is not discoverable online if it isn't publicly available online. Oh, so, so the, the reason is simple. Uh, I mean, so it's, it's a process of depositing the content is a challenge. It's a manual process. Great question, by the way. It's a manual process. Uh, like I mentioned, I highlighted that currently the UNSA, for instance, uh, employs two people that have to do this. They have to deposit content on behalf of faculty staff. Now, I know what people are thinking. Well, if, 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 if you have this platform, why not just create accounts for faculty staff to deposit content on their own? That process is called self-archiving. It's currently possible to do that at the UNSA. Unfortunately, uh, when you're working with complex tools like uh, these repository software tools, not everyone is able to do that, right? Go through the workflow of ingesting content. Um, I mentioned that we're taking a multi-pronged approach. Part of what we're doing is synthesizing colleagues on how to do this on their own. You will be surprised as to how, you, you might think that this, process of depositing content is trivial, but uh, not everybody is tech savvy, right? Uh, despite the fact that somebody could be a faculty staff, right? A PhD here. But, um, but yeah, so the reason why the content is not discoverable is because uh, it's simply not online yet, right? And this is what we're trying to, the kind of the problem we're trying to address for the most part. I don't know if I've answered the question. So maybe just to clarify, I think that's answering the, the broader question, which I also had was about the, the actual papers and things, but specifically I was asking about the data set that you used for this work. So in this case, you've already got these documents that have been labeled with classes that you're using to train your models. I was just curious why, the, so that subset, so not all of the papers for the future in the, in the system, but just the subset that you used for this training and such. Um, I was curious if there was like, um, political reasons or, you know, policy reasons why that couldn't also be in the GitHub along with the code to say, like, if you want to train these models yourselves, if you want to try, you know, some different processing techniques. Yeah, I, 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 get, I get the question. It's a question yeah. of, uh, uh, so, so I did a bulk of the, this work, this part I was talking about myself, and uh, it's just a question of me not uh, having the time to do that. The data is available, so uh, if there's something in the GitHub repository that's missing, I'm more than happy to share this with you. Everything is, there's, there's not, all the data that I'm talking about here um, is, is not supposed to be paywall. It's openly available, uh, ideally, including the actual PDF documents, actually. So it's not just the, the resulting data set that is labeled, but we can also make available the PDF documents. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be possible because uh, this, this is a gigabyte sized uh, document. So your, your average uh, document would be anywhere between I don't know, five meg all the way to 30 for scanned documents, right? And, and so we couldn't post. if you are interested in the actual PDF documents, we're more than happy to, to share those with you. I think I still have copies of those or share the scripts we're using to harvest the data. All right, so I'm, I'm, I mentioned that I work with a lot of talented students. Uh, uh, I, I, that, that's by far the most interesting part of my job, working with intelligent people. And I'm fortunate that I work uh, for an institution that attracts the best that we have to offer. Uh, some of the best people we have to offer in Zambia, at least anyway. And so Robert is extending the work I just spoke about. Um, um, he's doing a lot of interesting things. His he's, uh, details of what he's working towards are available on the website, the Data Hub website. If you're interested to uh, look up what he's doing, please visit the site uh, and you can reach out to him so that he can share with you preliminary results. Um, uh, but I just thought I'd mention that. And then this year I started working with, um, with, um, with Adrian and what he's trying to do really is to try and explore the possibility of automatically generating content, so metadata elements essentially. And this is the part where he will start to exploit uh, techniques such as name and integer recognition. Um, this is still a work in progress. We've only just started this. We are still at a stage where we're scoping out work that is going to do. Uh, but in, this, in essence, what we're doing is working towards automatically generating data, right? Uh, it's a completely different type of uh, problem here. Similar to, I guess, what things like automatic uh, summarization or something. But anyways, uh, the, bigger, the bigger goal here is uh, we are interested in making sure or seeing a sort of situation where all the research that is done in the country is uh, made available on a centralized location. And in fact, part of what we've been doing, part of what we've done is we've, we've set up a, a prototype platform 
it's, it's, it's meant to be a national ETD portal. So a platform that is going to centrally make available all the ETDs from the different higher education institutions in Zambia. Now, this idea is not new in any way, right? It's been done before. A number of other countries are doing this already. South Africa, for instance, does this. Um, but very few countries in, in Africa are, are doing so. We're trying to, we are doing all of this to, to work towards making sure that the stuff that we're making available um, is, is made available timely and has accurate information also. Um, I don't know if people have any thoughts about this project, but I thought I would quickly transition. I don't know how much time I still have left to quickly transition to um, a pet project of mine. This is serious, but something that I have an interest in. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we are working towards predicting learning outcomes for students, if there are no questions. All right, so... Okay, I think... Yep. Oh, yes, I think there are none at the moment. We, we can still proceed. All right, great. So... Um, I mentioned that I've been teaching at the UNSA since I got out of graduate school for the last three years now, right? And uh, there's this course that I've been teaching for the last three years. It's a computer systems and architecture course, high failure rates, right? Uh, it's very depressing. And so what we've been trying to do um, is we have an interest. There's a, there's a very big interest in this course, by the way, because uh, this course, because the program that is associated with this course is uh, uh, I think it constitutes uh, students that students that are funded by by government, right? So about ninety in any given year, ninety or so percent of the students have funding from the government. Um, in essence, these people are being trained to go and teach computer studies in, in schools. So we notice that there's a bit of a challenge in regard to uh, to certain courses, in particular um, computer systems and architecture. And so what we're, we're we've been working towards is trying to see if we can. Uh, build predictive models that will help us automatically identify students who are at risk of failing before they fail, right? It's a simple problem, right? This has been done. There's nothing new here. It's been done before. If you just look up uh, what, uh, predicting student learning outcomes, you notice that there's a lot that has been done, but this is specific to our use case, right? And so what we've been um, trying to do here is, uh, broadly speaking, like I said, we're trying to automatically detect at risk students. And over the last two years, we've been trying to, I know it sounds like a long time, two years, but because we've been on and off this project, uh, recruiting students to work on this uh, has been a bit of a problem. But we've got into a stage where we've identified potential sources of data, right? Uh, and I'm fortunate because I've, I've become somewhat of a domain expert here. Uh, over the years, over the last three years I've been teaching this course, I've identified markers, right, or features that are arguably correlated with learning outcomes. Um, so we see that there's certain demographic information, right, that is correlated with how someone is going to perform in this first year course. So things like which school you were at, for instance, whether you did computer studies, right, or not, right, all those things. But also we've identified that uh, we engaging with the course tends to help as well. Um, and potential sources of trying to determine whether or not somebody is engaging with the course is like uh, learning management system interaction logs, for instance. So how frequently you are logging into the learning management system and to access resources, right? Um, but also uh, when students have tutorial sessions, we take attendance, right? Um, these are all markers that we think can be used to, to, to build potential, uh, uh, potential models to help us uh, automatically detect who is at risk of failing. <clears throat> the other interesting things like uh, the relative workload that a student has, the students have a minor course, so you can minor in various courses. We've discovered that certain minor courses have an intense workload. Um, and we see a correlation between the workload and the performance, right? And of course, every year what we do is we, um, we do a poll where we, 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 we try and, uh, uh, and ask students what motivated them to do this course and, and a lot of other subjective responses. So collectively, all of these potential data, uh, data sources we view as, as, as uh, potentially being used as input features into these models that we plan to implement. Just to give you an idea of uh, these data sources that we're talking about, uh, like quiz assessments, for instance, um, because I coordinate, I've been coordinating this course for the last three years, so I, I, I'm very meticulous when it comes to compiling data. I have uh, a rich data set of some of course, if somebody needs to have access to this. 
with details for each student or each observation, the grades that they were getting, all the assessments. Typically in any given year, we have 20 quizzes, four tests and the final exam, right? So we have scores for all of these assessments for all students, right? Um, so uh, to give you an idea of interaction norms we're talking about, the UNSA uses uh, a Moodle uh, learning management system. If you're familiar with this, uh, you will know that uh, the data that you have access to in terms of the logs, interaction logs is quite rich, right? So we are thinking of uh, actually being so nuanced to look at uh, interaction to specific features of Moodle, not just looking at how many times somebody logs in, for instance, uh, right? We'll go a step further and maybe look at time also, right? Um, and then of course I mentioned subjective responses. There's a survey that we dish out every year where we ask students uh, questions related to experience with computers, motivation for doing the course, right? All the good stuff. Um, so uh, in terms of what we've actually started doing, working towards the implementation of these models, I'm working with uh, five amazing students. These are primary students. Uh, they were just doing their proposal presentation. I'm happy to share with you the proposal presentation. It's on YouTube, by the way, it's on my YouTube channel. Um, uh, I think we're going to do amazing stuff here. The thinking though, is that we are restricting this to just one course. But if you think about this, this is a problem that manifests itself um, in most education institutions, right? Not just UNSA. In fact, at different levels in primary schools as well. Our, our, our use case is specific to the higher education sector, but you could apply the same technique in primary schools, for instance. Granted, the markers or the features that you'd be working with would be different, right? Again, if you're interested in this data set, we, we are still organizing the data set. Some of it we can make available to you. It will be anonymized, of course, um, but uh, interesting stuff we're working towards. I don't know if people have any thoughts or, or questions uh, about that. There's very little to talk about there because we've only started the actual implementation side. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if there are any that would like to unmute at the moment, but um, actually we've seen quite a lot of interest coming up even from uh, Mr. Mumbi, of a previous uh, speaker on the panel, as well as Dr. Taylor, who, uh, of course, uh, actually, um, I mean, they, 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 they've, they've actually liked so far what, I mean, the, the research work that you've done and uh, would be interested to find out more and get in touch on how we can, they can actually um, get to, uh, get in touch or collaborate one or the other in the projects that you've, that, that you've shared as well as looking at other platforms that you can share your research on. Um, I don't know if there's, uh, if there are any, if there are any comments, I can't see others coming through, um, but of course I've seen, yeah, so okay, Dr. Taylor has also sh highlighted to say, coursework is also like a, a load, I mean, coursework load is, is an issue like in, that's common among uh, in universities. So that's also highlighting the relevance of uh, the research work that you've done. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's, yeah, it's really I, I, very interesting. Yeah, excellent. I'm, I'm glad uh, there's an interest in, in collaborating further with us. It turns out, right? so I, I, I also coordinated a postgraduate course uh, called uh, Data Mining and Warehousing. It's a master's level course uh, uh, in the CS department. And what we do, right, if people are interested, uh, this is more marketing here. What we do is uh, we have invited speakers from industry. Um, and so if people are interested, I, I could add you to our mailing list. Uh, last week we had uh, someone from the Invest Teaching Hospitals, UTH, who was talking about medical imaging and I talk about this right now. So uh, the goal here is uh, we are really interested in working with industry. I mean. Um, if you speak to people from ICTAS, they'll tell you that uh, the, the prob one of the problems we have in Zambia is the weak links that we have between academia and industry, right? We are trying here. So I'm, I'm happy to speak to whoever is interested in some of these things we, we are doing. So this is what I'm talking about now is, is again, work in progress. Here's a shocker for you. The whole lot of Zambia only has eight currently, anyway, eight qualified radiologists in public hospitals. That's against what? A population of about 17 plus million people. Um, if you read up this uh, research, this, this is not in any way associated with me, but I'm trying to motivate for why we're doing this. Uh, the number in 2019 was five. 
this is bad. It may not be bad if you have money because you will go to a private hospital. It's bad for somebody who doesn't have the resources. It's so bad that um, some medical images are not interpreted at all, right? It's so bad that uh, these radiologists have to choose which medical images they need to interpret, right? So we look at more serious cases. Um, so what we've been doing um, is we've been, we've been working very closely with uh, one particular radiologist from uh, the University Teaching Hospital. Um, and uh, I've actually been interacting with uh, Dr. Zulu for the last two years, actually informally, but we've only just, uh, we only started uh, seriously looking at this last year. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do is to try and figure out is if we can take advantage of uh, machine learning techniques to automate some of their workflows. Again, if you look up, if you just Google up medical imaging, right? Machine learning, uh, medical imaging, you notice that there's nothing new here, right? The challenge that is there though, is what uh, Dr. Taylor mentioned. The, the gory stuff that nobody wants to do, right? The less exciting stuff. Um, cleaning up and, and properly organizing the data. It turns out, right, that the workflow that these radiologists currently do is manual, right? So in essence, if you wanted to come up with uh, a solution for addressing this problem, a machine learning centric solution, you would not be able to do that because you don't have data. There's no data available. Well, there's no data available because they pretty much, they're still using a paper-based uh, uh, system, right? By the way, this image is, was the cutters of Dr. Zulu. This is what is at UTH uh, in 2021, right? They still uh, store those medical images in disks, right? Um, so if you, if they took a chest x-ray, right? Uh, and you go back after a year to do a review and if you want to do a comparison, it would be difficult for them to look up this information, right? It's not properly organized, right? Um, this is bad, but, but we know that uh, some of these are simple issues that can, I mean, they can easily be addressed by fourth years actually, right? If you've done uh, an information management type uh, course here or information retrieval, not, you notice that um, image search is nothing new here, right? This can be done. So what we're trying to do is before we can get to a stage where we, we start looking at the cool stuff to do with image classification, we are working very closely with uh, uh, is radiologists to try and see if we can automate some of their workflows that will ultimately result, result in properly organized bond digital data, right? And then we can start uh, maybe the painstaking task of perhaps labeling this data or something, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's quite sad really. This, this, is, this is what happens when you just go to a hospital and they'll tell you, wait for your x-ray. You don't know what's happening behind the scenes. This is exactly what happens there, right? Um, so there's very little that has uh, happened here, except that uh, we are interacting with uh, our colleagues there. Um, and I think I should mention this, right? Uh, part of the reason why they, there isn't an active interest in this particular area, or in fact, even the education sector, uh, if you compare this with the uh, financial sector, is because there's no incentive, right? Your average developer in Zambia doesn't have an incentive to work in this area. There's no money to be made here, to be honest with you, right? Um, I thought I'd mention this, but we're trying to see if maybe we can take advantage of, you know, postgraduate students and final year students to sort of like try and work on some of these problems. But also we are trying to explore the possibility of trying to solicit funding to do some of these things here. I, I think people need to know, right? Uh, the state of the hospitals, right? Anyway. Um, I don't know if there are any questions or thoughts about medical imaging workflows. Again, there isn't really a lot that has been done, but I thought I would mention this because, uh, uh, again, the, the part where you have to um, create this data set, right, to work on locally relevant problems might be tedious. It's not a pretty road, right? Uh, <clears throat> this is what people go through uh, when they make available these data sets that you download on Kergo. If there are no questions about medical imaging or thoughts, then I'll just quickly talk about another project that I recently became a part of. Um, so this is a UNDP funded project. Um, so the Zambia Metrological Department uh, has funded it. And so the UNSA was, um, was contracted to work on this project. I'm working with, I should mention here that this is a serious project that I'm working on together with colleagues from engineering and the computer science department. So I'm not claiming this project, I'm just a project team member. But what we're doing, right, is we're automating 
the process that those people that appear on TV and tell you to say it's going to rain, uh, it turns out that the process that they go through is sort of like manual. Like we're trying to automate that process. Uh, ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, uh, compare the results of um, uh, our machine learning or AI-centric solution with their current um, their current workflow to try and see which whether our proposed solution is going to be better from an effectiveness perspective, right? So accuracy, for instance. This is a long-term project. And in fact, if you were to see the timeline, this is supposed to go all the way up to, I believe it's 2023 or something. Um, that's because we, we will run the solution that we are currently working towards in parallel with their current, uh, their current workflow. Um, I just thought I would mention that um, in terms of what we are going to have to go through to do this, um, it's a lot of work, some weather stations, don't automatically generate digital data. So there's, there's a lot of work here that is going to involve us sieving through um, physical copies of rainfall patterns from the past, right? If you, again, there's nothing new about uh, automated weather forecasting here. If you go online here, um, there's, there's people that have done this already. This is just that we're contextualizing this to Zambia, right? Uh, if people are interested, we are using input features like surface to see temperature, for instance. Um, and then in our case, we are also going to associate the labels and the date of the observations with the specific weather stations. It turns out that Zambia is clustered into regions, right? With different or varying rainfall patterns. Um, uh, there's very little to talk about, but I thought I would mention this to motivate whoever is interested in jumping into this area to say, there's a ton of problems in Zambia, right? So you don't have to necessarily go to Kergo and start solving some some is it uh, the, the start working with that uh, hand, handwriting digit problem uh, uh, data set that you have in, in, in the psychic learn package, right? Um, there's stuff that you can do right here in Zambia. So, so in terms of the things that I'm actively involved with, uh, that's just about it. Uh, as part of part three, I, I do hope I still have time. I thought I would uh, just briefly talk about some other exemplar projects that have been done in Zambia. I don't claim any part with this pro of any part, right? I'm not associated with these projects. But these are projects that have been done in Zambia, and I, almost all of them have been done by students, postgraduate students at the University of Zambia. Um, and then I'll also talk about uh, some potential problems that you can think of if you're thinking of diving into this area and wanting to work on problems that are specific to Zambia. You can do this by looking at, uh, you know, toy, if we can call them toy projects, simple projects, not complex projects, right? Um, so in terms of exemplars here, um, I have links and just talk about, I had mentioned that uh, the, there's a project which is focused on trying to automatically detect foreign waves. Everybody knows if you're a farmer, or if you're into farming, or if you follow through with uh, what happens um, when it comes to agriculture in Zambia, we typically have the problem with foreign waves, right? Uh, the issue there is that uh, you only get to detect the issue when it's too late. So this project was aimed at trying to see if you could come up with an early warning and monitoring system early on before the problem um, worsens. The, this is a dissertation. There's a link to this, um, this dissertation there. It's on the Unza Institutional Repository. There are also publications that have been spun off from this. So if you just look up uh, for automatic identification of Fuami in Zambia, you'll find links uh, to research uh, done by Francis um, and uh, I don't know who the other individual is here. But Francis Chul is, is, is the author of this particular dissertation. Um, so that's agriculture, right? Um, and again, what you notice is, is there's something very peculiar. If you look at this whole notion of machine learning, you'll notice that uh, most of these countries will tend to gravitate more towards certain sectors, right? Uh, I would like to argue here that part of the reason why you have very few people looking at uh, the agricultural sector and education sector is because there are no incentives, to be honest, right? No incentives at all. Uh, scaling a solution like this, right, is next to impossible. Right? Um, so, so if you're, if you're looking at addressing these sort of problems from a financial perspective, the rewards here, uh, your typical developer will realize that, they, that it's just not worth it to spend time doing this, unless if you have time, like researchers such as myself, who are paid to do this, by the way. Um, and then there's another student who uh, I think, uh, I think Louise is still working for Zamtio, I believe. What he did was he he decided to take advantage of uh, unsupervised machine learning to see if you could come up, of a, come up with a way of automatically um, doing things like automatically segmenting uh, customers, right? 
example in this particular case. What you, you might find interesting here, this is what was working towards developing a product recommender system here, but what you might be interested in reading up about in here is the features he was using. This is not your traditional telco features like your core detailed records, for instance. Nope, things have changed, right? Um, I happen to have uh, experience here. In my previous life, I worked uh, as a DBA for almost four years uh, for a telecommunications company. Zen, Celtel, Airtel back in the day. And we did not have uh, weird things they have now like the KYC database, right? So the loyal customer client database. It turns out that he included all those things. Yeah? And the result was uh, pretty interesting actually, right? And this is a, a potential solution that if you had access to this sort of data set, a potential solution you could suggest to telco um, organizations, right? They're interested in making money. One of the ways they make money is through targeted campaigns, those SMSs you receive. Um, I'm not sure how this is done, but back in the day when I used to work in this sector myself, it was a manual process, right? Um, and then um, there's this really interesting project. I think uh, Knotts was graduating this year. He works for Natsev. Um, he's one of the IT managers there, but he was working towards trying to, again, take advantage of unsupervised machine learning. Um, to automatically predict or to forecast fraud, right? potential fraud uh, occurring. If you look up um, the financial intelligence report, this is a serious problem, right? Uh, you want to read up uh, on this. this is exciting stuff here, right? So I guess one of the key takeaway points from this and this previous topic is it's not just about supervised machine learning. There's also unsupervised machine learning where you don't know what you're looking for but you're interested in uncovering patterns that might exist in the data, right? Um, um, sadly, I don't know about the, I don't think you'd have access to this data. When Knox gave a talk to our postgraduate course last year, he did ask about the data. He said he would try and see if he could anonymize the data and help us with uh, the process of requesting to gain access to the data. If this happens, uh, you, you probably see it on our uh, research group website. Now, I thought, uh, um, I thought I would now talk about, I hope I still have time. How much time do I have left, Joseph? Um, so you have, you have like, um, so uh, about almost 30 more minutes, but uh, maybe if we could still uh, wrap up in 15 to give people an early break, that would still be fine. Yeah, I'm also interested in having a conversation about what I'm talking about here. But but so here's the thing here. Uh, this is this yeah. is just me uh, me talking about things that I think are worth looking at in Zambia. There's more, right? I'm not saying this list I'm going to talk about is uh, exhaustive, but I thought I would put this out there, right? So if you're interested in getting into machine learning and you're thinking, what sort of toy break projects can I work on uh, other than the these default data sets that you like, like the Boston housing thing that everybody's working on, right? Oh, if you look at Zambia, right? The potential problems that you can work on are everywhere, right? These uh, uh, mainstream uh, or print media, for instance, like uh, Daily Mail, for instance, you typically have uh, things, right, being mentioned in there. All you have to do is do a bit of reading. Not too long ago, right? Uh, now, I know this probably is controversial here. Uh, government was claiming that they needed help in monitoring content coming in from radio. Now, ask yourself this. How do you monitor content coming in from a radio station? This is like a radio station that uh, will broadcast 24 seven, right? Well, you can carve this out as a potential machine learning problem. Your data is the audio, right? I'm sure there's interesting things that can be done there. Now, I'm not here to discuss the implications of you working on this problem. Is it ethical or not? I don't know, especially that government is involved. This is surveillance here, right? Surveillance 101. Now, I, my interest here is never about how people are going to use my solution. My interest is always, of course, I think about ethical considerations, but my interest is always, what sort of solution can I provide to help people make sense out of data that they're generating? Right? Um, not too long ago, there was something in, 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 in the news. This, uh, ZRA was experimenting with drones, right? To try and uh, identify people that are attempting to evade tax. Uh, to evade tax right? Now, you would probably have to reach out to ZRA here to gain access to drone footage, for instance, but this is something worth looking at, right? The reason I'm including some of these things is they, they have a wow factor to them. These are exciting problems that you can work on, right? They'll motivate you to work, to work on such things. If you move around, um, I cycle around a lot myself, but if you move around the city, uh, I was headed towards Chongwe here, you'll find these things there, right? Ask yourself, how are we using this data? How can we 
take advantage of AI or machine learning to help government better make use of this data. Again, uh, as a researcher, I'm not interested in, in, in why government has put these things up, right? There are people that will say weird things like, oh, they're spying on us, I don't know, right? I look at the good side of everything, right? I think this is a good thing in my opinion, right? But uh, there's more, right? As you are approaching certain, you know, uh, as you're approaching so-called top plazas that are all over the show now, you will notice that there's data that we are collecting. So if you drive through a top plaza, you notice that your vehicle will be automatically detected, right? And then the cashier will, uh, will ask you to pay a 20 quarter for the small vehicle like I do, uh, and then they'll give you back a receipt, right? What interesting things can we do? I always joke, right? And I hope nobody's going to be offended. I always joke to say, do we actually need the people here? I've been to places in the world where you don't have a human being here, right? Don't. Now, I know this is controversial. They'll lose jobs, okay? Fair enough. But we can do this. We can permit this, right? We can, uh, we can get rid of them or something. Maybe save money or, or train them so that they do more important things. Not, uh, not get your money and then give you a receipt, right? Anybody can do that. Um, but, but so here's the other thing. If you look at mainstream media, ask yourself this. I don't know when last you went to Zambian Watchdog, right? And uh, you, you read through all the 900 and so comments. <laughs> I don't do that myself, right? But the question is, can we take advantage of things like sentiment analysis and actually help people make sense out of the perception that people on social media have in regards to these things we talk about, right? This is a simple problem. Okay. Sentiment analysis is nothing new. The problem though is that it will be difficult for you to, to do sentiment analysis on comments associated with what Zambians post. Why? Not everything is in English, right? So this is something you can do, right? And, and, and really extracting data from these platforms is, uh, I mean, you'd have to uh, struggle with trying to make sense out of Facebook's graph API and whatnot, but, but it's, there's nothing difficult about this. We've done this ourselves, right? Uh, when was this? I think last year we were playing around with data we harvested from Zambian Ostog and we want to date, dating back from 2012 it was, I think, rich data set, right? <clears throat> but there's, there's something else. If you look at uh, translation of raw, of low resource languages, like Chichewa and Bemba, it's horrible. Uh, what, what this thing is showing is, Kamaridias, I'm telling myself, means uh, if you're diligent, um, you always get good rewards, right? It's, it's nothing close to what you have here as a translation. So I'm not going to be able to do it. Nah, this is bad. You know why it's bad? Because there's no support for languages that we speak in Zambia. The reason there's no support is because there's no one actively working on trying to make things better in Zambia. But these are problems we can work on, right? Uh, these are three projects we can work on. There's nothing new here. Um, I, I hope uh, we still have time. Uh, this is what I had for you. Uh, in essence, uh, this thing was tagged as learning from, data, from uh, our local data, but my thinking was um, I wanted to tell a story about what we should be doing, right? And what potential locally relevant problems we can be experimenting with, right? Uh, as people that are diving into this research area. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if people have any thoughts or something. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thierry. So I'll leave the floor open in case there are questions. Um, at least, I, of course, we got to address quite a number while uh, we're going through. But if I thought there are any questions, maybe you can just uh, indicate, then we can let you uh, speak. So we have 46 participants. Um, questions from anyone? So, okay, we have something in the Q&A. Um, so there was Kachingo asking about, uh, Kachigo asking about funding. Um, oh yeah, okay, so he was just comment, uh, okay, they were just commenting to say funding is a bit poor in Zambia. Then we have, uh, We have uh, someone commenting on. Okay, so just someone commenting on their thoughts about the overview of um, telecoms. Um, so they just said, 
Yeah, so they just said uh, they would just like to comment to say uh, the computer science student, I mean, uh, comment to say that most of the computer science students uh, only think of working in telecom companies and banks without having the mind of uh, mind that is broad of taking technology in, uh, in, I think, other fields as well, is what they meant. So there's need to change that mindset from uh, fel among students, fellow students. So I think it's just a mindset change uh, point there. And then there was a question around whether um, uh, your projects, uh, like how you treat beginners uh, of data mining in your projects or people that are interested in getting advice. Maybe, I don't know if you could tackle this. So there's, I mean, I think that's the main question. The, the others were sort of uh, just forms of advice. So there's a question saying with your projects, how do you treat beginners of data mining? Well, so what I um, do is, uh, if I can, uh, I don't know if you want me to just quickly talk about treating beginners. Uh, so my yes. philosophy has always been uh, for some courses that I teach, if somebody's interested, I, I will invite them to be a part of, especially that most of these uh, interactions we have are online, they're virtual. I will, I will add them to the mailing list and uh, I'm always happy to help where I can if I have the time, by the way. And I'm hoping, by the way, that uh, going forward, perhaps we can do much more with this deep Indala X thing and then try and see if we can have regular meetups and not just w meet uh, once a year. I don't know if there are regular meetups, but I'll be happy to be a part of this. It, it really feeds into my, my role of performing a community engagement. Um, I'm paid to do this. Um, so I'm, I'm always happy to work with beginners. And most of the students that I interact with, at, at least at fourth year, are beginners, right? We don't have courses where, we don't have data mining centric courses. So what I do with my fourth year students is they enroll into the postgraduate course. The students that are working on predicting student learning outcomes, for instance, they've been attending the master's level courses so that they learn what needs to be done. So I'm always happy to help. Um, uh, if you need help with guidance on how to do stuff, uh, if I have the time, I'm more than happy to, to help. And then these weren't questions here, but in terms of funding being poor, it starts right here, right? I mean, we, we could possibly organize hackathons, right? To, we don't necessarily always have to be obsessed about money. Now, I know money is important, yes, but we can take advantage of these things, organizations we set up a bit deep in our example here to try and see how we can work on relevant problems. Something as simple as creating a data set. You can do, I don't know what the previous hackathon you spoke about, for instance, involved doing, but part of what you can do is, is you cover out a problem so that you're creating a data set, a local data set. Uh, there was a, a talk I was attending about how uh, people from public health were, were using machine learning, right, to work with uh, genome data. My question, my, my question was, is this, was this data from Zambia? No, it wasn't from Zambia, right? It's an openly available data set. Why aren't we working on problems related to Zambia? Well, we don't have a data set. But we can do this, right? Uh, I know it will take time, but uh, we can do this. And then again, on mindset change, you're right. Um, but you can't blame somebody to, you can't blame somebody who is motivated by money. You have to survive, right? Um, this, uh, uh, perhaps we, I mean, there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of mind, mind shifting of the mindset. I don't know what the solution is here, but. I know my, my mindset shifted a long time ago, but uh, yeah, I don't know if any, any other questions. Yeah, I just wanted to contribute on uh, the submissions of uh, Dr. Piri. So uh, I happen to be uh, one of uh, his, uh, his, his, his students, and I think he's made, uh, he's making a lot of effort in trying to um, uplift um, the eye landscape here in Zambia. So if you go to YouTube, for instance, you'd find, uh, I think, most of his uh, lectures are on YouTube. So um, if you you'd want to learn about data mining, machine learning, I think he's uploaded most of his uh, content on, uh, on, on, uh, on YouTube. And then when it comes to funding, um, I think uh, initiatives like uh, these ones, the Indava, obviously Indava was funded by some people. And then if these people see us, uh, it's mostly guys from Google, who came together and then put up these uh, funds. And if, if, they, if really they get to see us uh, to be serious people in what we're doing, uh, uh, participating in events like this one and other initiatives that, uh, that uh, we try to come up with as a community, I think uh, funding might, uh, by, might be more. But if we don't take events like this one seriously, it, it really becomes difficult for even people like ourselves to solicit for more funds. 
those there will be no justification so i think it starts from this level uh, i mean really how are we taking advantage of, of, of these initiatives once um we leverage opportunity opportunities like these ones i think even uh funding it will come uh, naturally yeah so i just wanted to contribute that All right. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Asin. So we also have um, uh, maybe just before uh, Dr. Piri comments on that, we also have another question regarding the part where he had mentioned to say at Zambia, uh, at, at, at the University of Zambia, um, um, there's a problem of only having two faculty members that deposit content into the IR. So what measures are being taken to ensure that depositing content is effective? Uh, so, um, so Sharon had missed this point and she just wanted clarity. Yeah, so in terms of measures that have been put in place here, uh, recently there was a, a policy, it's called an IR policy that uh, was signed, so it's, it's, uh, it's official now, that mandates people to deposit content uh, or research that they publish, right? So you, you, are, you are required to do that. That's, so that's, that's one measure that has been put in place, but also what we are doing. We work very closely with these people that work uh, in the unit that's responsible for depositing this content. Not just to implement these machine learning centric solutions, but also to raise awareness. And raising awareness involves simple road shows where we are interacting with our colleagues from other departments that don't appreciate the importance of doing this. They forget that it directly feeds into your ranking as an institution, right? Um, so you're, you're only as good as your weakest link here. So th there's quite a number of things that are being done. And in fact, there are, there are other initiatives that we are not even actively a part of that are being done. So it's, it's a problem that has been uh, uh, noted and people realize that there's a serious problem. There's, a lot, there's, there's actually quite a lot being done here. Uh, if you read up my, my, uh, uh, some of these publications I was showcasing, there's mention of some of these initiatives. I hope I've answered the question. Um, I think you have, uh, maybe we can get any comment from, 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 uh, from Sharon, if, if there's any further clarity. And then I have a question from, uh, Makasa, uh, Kanyanta, whom, as we mentioned earlier, is also the winner of the, the, the deep learning hackathon that we, I mean, the, the hackathon that we had over the weekend in machine learning. So, uh, Makasa Kanyant is asking, can, can you help students with uh, deep learning projects, uh, project ideas and uh, development of the ideas? Yeah, sure, sure I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, I, if, if you're at UNSA, I work from, uh, you can reach out to me, but I work from the fifth floor, it's called the Education Building. Uh, I'm in room 505. Five. Uh, you find these details on the UNSA website, actually, my, my office number. Um, just shoot me an email and then I'm always happy to chat uh, to students about potential problems they're working on. And in fact, I'm always happy to call to call supervise students from other schools. So if you're from engineering, for instance, and you're working on a fourth year project, it's a deep learning project, usually the requirement is you have to be supervised by faculty staff from your school, right? We can come up with an arrangement where I co supervise. I mean, I would have an interest in that because whatever comes out of that could potentially be, be published. So I'm happy to offer advice. Um, uh, just send me an email and then we can talk more about whatever it is you're thinking of. In fact, what I, what I also do is I, I meticulously keep tabs of potential problems to solve. So if you like text mining, I, I have uh, some interesting problems that I can suggest to you also. All right. All right. Thank you, doctor. So I guess that also answers the question that uh, some, some, uh, Siamu Konka uh, Monga also had around the same and trying to specialize. Uh, Salem Kachali also uh, uh, offered to say, so like if, if there's any need for data entry personnel, uh, he has actually a fleet of friends willing to help uh, because there are a lot of fields that need uh, data to be transferred uh, uh, from paper to digital. I agree. I mean, so some of the things, uh, the medical imaging talk, for instance, um, I mean, if we get to a stage where we're able to secure funding, I mean, we certainly need a fleet of uh, people to do that. Right? It's tedious to, to label that sort of data. Very tedious. But thanks for that. 
Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, Doctor. I think we can give back uh, people like just 10 minutes to uh, their lunch break, then we'll come back uh, 10 minutes earlier again. Um, if possible, uh, yeah, you know, by, yeah, just 10 more minutes earlier. But thank you very much for uh, what you've shared. I think it, it brings out uh, the practicality in how all these things could be applied. Normally, um, in African setup, we would actually look at all this to be just us assimilating knowledge and never getting to see uh, the use of it or the light of it in, in our day-to-day -day industry. But it's, it's, it's really uh, encouraging and enlightening to see um, at least someone from the academia showing how all this could be uh, uh, be made practical in our day-to-day -day lives. It's, 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 it's really an honor to, to have listened to uh, your journey so far and uh, the research and, and, and the successes that you've had so far. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, so the thing here, right, is, uh, um, thank you for having me, by the way. The, the thing here is, I mentioned the weak link between industry and academia. The reason why people don't realize there are a lot of smart people in these institutions, right? Uh, I know of people, many other people that are doing machine-centric research, right? But I consider to be experts, right? Uh, who have far more expertise than I do. But the problem is uh, people don't know. And the reason they don't know is because we don't have strong links, right? Between academia and industry. I think this is the perfect starting point. You know, it, it involving people from academia to be a part of such initiatives, like Deep Learning X, for instance. You know, so, so yeah, thank you for having me. And I just wanted to apologize here. I really wanted to be a part of the, the, the entire uh, event, but I have a prior engagement. And so I won't be joining you in the afternoon, but I do hope this recording will be shared. I'm really keen to, to really pay back the other interactions. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Doctor. So um, beaming back the project, uh, the, the, the program rather, we.